Something that often stumps people trying to get into oscilloscope art is the following question. Where do I get an oscilloscope? And the follow-up, I found one, but how do I know that it will actually do what I want it to? There's a few ways you can go about this. First off, before you go out and buy anything, there are several software oscilloscopes that will display images on your computer instead of dropping some cash on an old scope. Oscilloscope can be downloaded from this website called oscilloscopemusic.com. All you have to do is route your computer's audio to the app using something like Black Hole or Soundflower, and then play whatever sounds you'd like to visualize. On the same website is a program called Aussie Studio. It has a lot of functionality, like live coding in C++ and connecting to Blender, but you can also just use it for its built-in display. This one isn't free though, and as far as I know, it isn't receiving regular updates. Finally, Aussie Render can be downloaded from GitHub. I'm not too familiar with this one, since I don't personally use it, but it has some nice things like importing and displaying object files, as well as creating scripts using Lua. Links are in the description for videos James has made explaining how to use it. Another option that doesn't look nearly as nice as the others is using a stereo imager like this one in your DAW. You can put it in Lissajou mode, which will essentially mimic what the oscilloscope does. Not great, but if you just want to experiment, it totally works. Okay, but if you want to get a real bona fide scope, where can you go? Well, many places, but I usually get them on eBay. There's also Craigslist, as well as other similar sites. Do a little digging and you'll find them. They're not too hard to come by. I usually start the search by simply typing analog oscilloscope. Once you've found one, here's what you need to look for to make sure it'll do what you want. All it needs is to have two inputs, X and Y, and an option for something called XY or Lissajou mode. You can usually tell by the picture if it'll work or not, but if you want to make absolutely certain, I recommend checking the manual. Just look up the name of the scope, plus the word manual in your search engine of choice, and read the manual to see if it has these features. All right. Looks like I found the manual for this scope. I'm just gonna download it real quick, and then we can take a look and confirm what we saw in the pictures. Here we are. Let's go to the table of contents. All we'll need to look at is this list of features for the scope. That's on page three, so we'll scroll down a bit. And here it is, other features. Channel one can be applied as horizontal deflection, while channel two provides vertical deflection. This scope will definitely work for our purposes. Finally, there's a couple other non-scope options for creating these images. You can use an old video game console called a Vectrex, or a modded CRT TV. For those who don't know, before everyone had flat screen TVs, everyone used CRTs or cathode ray tube televisions. They're those giant bulky ones that weigh about a million pounds. I won't go into how to modify those displays to work in this series, but if you have some analog electronics know-how, they offer some cool variations from the green phosphor look of the oscilloscope at the cost of greatly reduced bandwidth. Once you have an analog oscilloscope, the next question that often comes up is, how the heck do I get sounds from my computer onto the scope? This question can be a bit tricky to answer since everyone's setup is gonna be a little bit different. Here's how I normally go about doing it. First, you're going to want to get an audio interface. Something with at least two outs will be fine, Additionally, we're looking for something specific. We need an interface that is DC coupled rather than AC coupled. What is AC and DC coupling, you might ask? Basically, AC coupling will remove very low or static frequencies. With DC coupling, these frequencies won't be removed and will allow us to better display images on the scope. Notice how the image on the left is super fuzzy and keeps trying to adjust to the center, while the one on the right is crisp and stable. The adjustments to the center are because of the AC coupling. The fuzziness is because my laptop can't generate a loud enough signal. This means I need to crank the gain on the scope, leading to a lot of noise in the image. All in all, an audio interface is the way to go for the sharpest possible image on the scope. Okay, so now that we have a DC coupled audio interface, we can get started. To do this, we'll need some special cables that allow us to connect to the scope's BNC inputs. Luckily for us, there's these BNC to RCA adapters. Now from the interface, we can use a quarter inch to RCA cable. Plug the quarter inch end into outs one and two of the interface, and then plug the RCA ends into the adapters. This isn't the only way to do this by any means. For example, if you're playing music on a CD, you might have the outputs of your CD player connecting to the scope instead, skipping out on the audio interface. 
The main thing to remember is that to connect to the scope, you'll need an adapter for the B and C inputs, as well as having your sound source be DC coupled. For those folks using software oscilloscopes, you'll need to do something similar by routing your computer's internal audio. You'll need a piece of software like Black Hole or, if you're old school, Soundflower. Those are the two main ones I know, but there are other options out there. What you need to do is set your computer's audio to send to whatever routing software you happen to be using, Soundflower in my case, and then select that as the input in the oscilloscope app. Finally, let's take a look at how to set up the scope to display our images properly. There's a lot of different knobs and settings on here, but there's only a few that we really care about. Depending on your scope, the location of these will vary. Before we start, make sure that you're not sending any audio to the scope and that the brightness of the beam is turned all the way down. You'll usually see this knob marked as intensity or inten for short. Sometimes there's more than one intensity knob, just go ahead and turn them all down. This way, we minimize the chance of burning out the phosphor from having the brightness too high. Then, we'll need to make sure that both of our inputs are DC coupled. Next, we can put the scope into XY or Lissajou mode. From here, turn up the brightness until the dot becomes visible. Now that we can see it, we need to use our horizontal and vertical positioning knobs to put the dot in the center of the screen. Then, I'll turn the volume up on my audio interface. The more we control volume from the computer and our interface, the less amplification we'll need the scope to do. This helps to keep the image as crisp as possible. From there, I usually draw a square and adjust the volts over div knobs until it looks right. I usually go until it fills out the screen. Once I've got the general shape in line, I'll start using these fine-tuned parts at the tips of the knobs to get it just right. For the last step, I'll adjust this focus knob to get the lines as thin as possible. If you look carefully, in the corners of the square, there is some not-so-insignificant distortion. There's not much we can do to fix this just by dialing in the settings I've already shown you. We need to calibrate the entire scope for that, which is definitely beyond the scope of this video. One final thing you might have to adjust is the trace rotation. You'll need a pretty small screwdriver like this one. I think this one is 3 millimeters or something like that. You're just going to use it to turn this screw and make sure there's no left or right rotation on the image. Depending on the scope, you may or may not have to do this. The older the scope, the more likely you'll have to fiddle with it. And now we're done. We can now use our scope to start playing music or making art.